So finally we got to part three. You can see that the date has incremented. So apparently I've been up all night recording or something. Um, and assuming parts one and two got posted properly, we're almost there. So we've seen the basics of VR diagrams. That would be the entity, the relationship, the idea that entity has attributes. We know that we are working towards eventually being able to take these diagrams and convert them uh, wholesale to the schema that we would plug into an SQL database server. And we might notice that once we get to that point, once we've turned our diagrams into database tables, we can finally begin actually playing with a database server. So part three is, I think, the longest of the parts. And it goes through a few more examples. Um, and it also begins to, we can see seeping in are some pretty applied looking things. We're going to see the word key in a few minutes, which is reassuring. It's reassuring to see that we're finally moving towards databases. So let's design an ER diagram to model sales of produce. We just can't stop with this fruit example. So as usual, we look at this set of rules and, and keep in mind for the marking of assignments and exams and things, it's not usually that you get like one mark per rule, but certainly um, the marking does break down about did you satisfy the rule did you satisfy the entire rule and in many cases if we allocate some number of marks to a particular uh, bullet point like if I said this is worth three marks usually because of how hard it is to adjudicate sort of middle cases if you're not meeting the requirements of the rule it's hard to really give you any of those three marks um, so keep that in mind so it is good to use the set of rules we give as a checklist of making sure you've implemented every uh, entity and every constraint so um, each of the products we have has a name, a source where the product came from, and a price per kilogram. Uh, we have customers, we have sales representatives. Each of them have names, phone numbers, and email addresses. And maybe you can see already, you could begin mapping out things like um, entities and basic attributes. Uh, we now can see the first example of what probably should be a relationship. Customers place orders with a sales representative. Uh, every order has a date, and the order can contain multiple products. Um, it's interesting because this issue here, we've already seen a few cases where there might be some confusion about should I use an entity to represent an order? Should I have order just fall out of the relationship between customer and sales representative? I think in this case, the, the weight is on, the weight of evidence says orders should be entities. But certainly, even if it didn't, this one right here would tip it over. So um, we can't have a relationship <clears throat> whose arity is unknown. If an order can contain as many products as I add, my diagram can only have a relationship, have a finite number of legs. It can either point, it can point to customer, it can point to sales representative, it can point to product, I guess, but it can't point to an unknown number of products. So that right there means we have to have order be its own entity. <clears throat> when I choose to put a product in an order, uh, I purchase a specific weight of the product. And the key there is that the, amount, the quantities of a product aren't dictated by the product. So one order could have a kilogram of apples, the next order could have two and a half kilograms. So it's purchased by weight, but the exact weight could differ between orders. This is significant. If this weren't the case, it would confuse things a bit. I, I don't know whether adding the constraint actually makes, the, makes your life easier, but it's, this is a very significant, it modifies the data model significantly. So it says that if I decide to purchase raspberries, then the raspberries only appear once in my order. If I want to purchase one kilogram and then I want to purchase a second kilogram, that would be logged in the order as a single two kilogram allocation of raspberries. So I don't have to worry about adding the same product to an order more than once. I just batch up the total weight of that product. Now, of course, I could place two different orders, um, but the key here is that uh, inside of one order, the product's either in the order or not. And then when it's in the order, I have some specific quantity. Now that in the order or not sounds a lot like um, if I have that assurance, maybe I know that I can use a relationship. So here are the basic set of entities. Um, maybe that sh by now, hopefully, if you've gotten all the way to part three through parts one and two, maybe this part of the diagram should be clear. We should be able to lay this out. Um, and then we just have to begin drawing relationships between them. So maybe uh, these, some of these are sort of the obvious way to draw this in. Um, the customer, uh, it's hard to tell whether we should draw this in, but I would say the customer shouldn't have any relationship attaching them to sales rep. 
We, we could argue maybe there's a case where a customer always communicates with the same sales rep to place their order, but I'm going to argue instead that the customer places an order and the order has a sales rep attached to it. We don't maybe internally care too much about a relationship between a customer and a specific sales rep. If this were tracking something else, um, if this were tracking some ongoing uh, running order a customer is placing, maybe it's significant that they're always in contact with the same rep. But here, instead, the relationship between customers and sales reps is indirect. It just happens via the order entity. So a customer places an order. An order is sold by or placed through a sales representative. And an order contains products. All of these, as currently written, are unconstrained relationships. Uh, and so we, we, can, we can look at them and verify maybe some relationships need some constraints. So um, I don't know about order and product. That's going to end up being a bit of an issue uh, later. We'll talk about how to constrain that. But um, certainly uh, we might want to discuss whether an order can be associated with more than one customer or more than one sales rep because as currently written, there is no constraint on this. A customer may exist and never place an order, which I think should be allowed, and an order may exist with no associated customers or sales reps, which might be a bad idea. Um, but before we talk about that, let's, let's talk about adding all the attributes we need. So we're still missing something, which is, as I said, this, we have to meditate on this for a little while. So the contains relationship, an order contains a product. But, but I said earlier that a product is ordered, when I add it to an order, it, it's purchased by weight. And the weight isn't a function of the product. You can buy any number of different kilograms of raspberries in different orders, and so that's not a function of the product itself. It's how the product is tied into the order. So you have to find some way of modeling that. And we think, well, okay, so an order contains a product. Whenever an order contains a product, there is an associated weight. There is not an associated weight if the order doesn't contain a product. So it sounds a lot like, yeah, weight is attached to the contains relationship. It's, it only exists if the order contains the product. Um, and certainly, I, I, maybe that's a good thing to think about. That's, that should be by now our obvious, our go-to here. We should talk a bit about whether we have to do it that way. Now, what I'm going to do, the, the chain of slides I'm going to start here, we're just going to have to abruptly end it because we, we need a feature that we haven't seen yet. And we're not quite ready to see it because this example isn't done with its other, the other points it's making. But I want to explore this a bit. So I think this is just fine. That works great. But we need to understand that there could be cases where this is too limiting. And so we should know what to do if this isn't going to work. And we think, well, if uh, the relationship places a limitation that we don't uh, we're not able to abide by, what can we do to integrate weight something else um, to some other way? So I, I could try this. <clears throat> I could say, well, what I could do is I could say I have a product that can be purchased in any quantity. And then I've got this specific sort of pseudo entity, and these are going to end up causing us some trouble, called bought quantity. So I've got raspberries, but I also have two kilograms of raspberries or one kilogram of raspberries. That's a bought quantity of raspberries. Now the way it's drawn on this slide isn't correct because we can see bot quantity is just an entity by itself. How do I know this is a bot quantity of raspberries versus pears or something else? So we can see we might have to be careful about this. Maybe you're looking at this and saying, this is ridiculous, why would I ever want to do this? That's probably a good way to think about it. I still want to explore when we would be allowed to use an entity here. So even if it works, it's a less elegant solution. It's true that for the most part, if we do it properly, adding extra entities, so executing this correctly, which it isn't currently being done, um, isn't a bad idea. It, we'd like to avoid it, but it doesn't hurt the model too much. And in some cases, it turns out that it actually doesn't complicate the eventual database schema at all. It might turn out that with the conversion that we're going to learn in part four, whatever we produce here would be exactly the same as what I had up here. So we should explore this further. Um, so the first thing is, the way I've drawn this, uh, we're actually missing constraints that, that uh, we really need here. Because the way it currently works with these many-to-many -many relationships is I could define these bot quantities that are attached to nothing. I could just define a bot quantity of 3 kilograms, which never appears in any order and never is tied to any product. So I think what I need is uh, the bot quantity to, every bot quantity corresponds to exactly one product and exactly one order. Now that creates uh, another problem, which is that these relationships as they're phrased don't really allow me to then include the same bot quantity in a different order. 
So for example, if I have a bot quantity of three kilograms, then I could have order number one contains a quantity of three kilograms of pairs. And that would mean that I have manifested the relationship order number one and three kilograms. And that would sort of tie into this weird unknown box here. Well, that's great. What if I want to add three kilograms of something else to order two? Okay, so order two contains three kilograms of apples. Well, uh, I, I don't, I can't, because three kilograms is tied to exactly one order, and it's already been tied to order one. So maybe you can see, introducing an entity here, although possible, um, isn't as obvious as just uh, throwing in a new box and attaching it with relationships. Uh, so we have to definitely take away this rounded arrow, because I want the same quantity to be associated with more than one order. But now I've got a different issue, which is that uh, I'm going to redraw my example from earlier. So order one contains three kilograms of pears. And I am now allowed to write that order two contains three kilograms of, but then I try and write apples. And the problem there is that this means that any bought quantity can only correspond to one product. So it, once you've bought three kilograms of some product, you can't buy three kilograms of any other product because every bought quantity corresponds to exactly one product. So we've got the same headache happening on the other end. Now it turns out that what's really happening here is that bought quantity isn't, it's never supposed to be its own real entity. It's supposed to be sort of a tag sitting on top of a product. So I can have one product, raspberries, and various different quantities I buy of that product in different orders, three kilograms, five kilograms, whatever. Um, so I don't really want to have it sitting here as its own apparently independent entity in the world. Even if I'm tying it in to order and product, the way I'm tying it in doesn't sacrifice that independence. So it turns out, uh, and so this is pointing out, what if I want to include the same quantity of two products? It turns out we need some fancy box and diamond format that we haven't seen yet. So just to be clear, in general, adding entities isn't a big deal, but be very careful that when you sacrifice the dependence that a relationship imposes, that you think that all the way through. So it turns out that if we define it using something called a weak entity, which we're going to get to in this lecture, but not just yet, that we can solve that problem. Um, but we don't have that yet, so we should be careful. So in any case, we could define an entity. It would require going through some steps. A weak entity would do the trick. We could do that, but hey, this works fine, so I think we should use this. And on an assignment, so the moral of the story here is, on an assignment, if you were to notice that this is the obvious fix, then do it. But it might be on an assignment or an exam, the list of rules puts you in a position where this isn't obvious, or for some reason the way you've modeled things doesn't make this solution feasible. In that case, entity doesn't hurt things, but be very careful when you define an entity that is somehow contingent on some existence of a relationship or some other entity that you properly associate it with that entity. So in this case, it turns out the solution is a weak entity and a, weak, and a uh, supporting relationship, which we'll see later. Um, the key there is that as long as you've thought it through and whatever you end up modeling is faithful to the data, extra entities or relationships or whatever, unless you've added them and they're completely irrelevant. So it is pointing out you're not supposed to add relationships or entities, like I said in part one and two. Don't add entities that we didn't ask for that are irrelevant to the what we asked for. If you add entities and relationships in service of what the question is asking and it's faithful to the data and you've thought, thought it through, you shouldn't expect to lose marks for that. You may have to make an argument uh, if you lose marks. You may lose marks accidentally and have to argue about it, but we generally expect to give you the marks if the model is faithful to the data. Um, there is a section in the book, and it's in the, I believe it's in the chapter I posted to, that talks a bit about this. There, there are some rules we can use, some rules of thumb generally, to figure out when we don't need an entity. And if we, if we can get rid of entities, it's nice, but we don't have to do that. So the first question, I guess, once we've solved uh, the basic set of uh, attributes on relationships and entities, is what cardinality constraints do we need? So a key issue, we saw in part two that we can add cardinality constraints. And just like with any other new toy, we now want to add them to everything. And I warned about that in part two, that we should be very careful. Just because we have this doesn't mean we should use it. Um, and the same holds here. We already saw some places where maybe an order should be placed by one customer. Maybe an order should only have one sales rep. We have to be careful before we make that assumption. But those are places where that might be helpful. I can't see a situation where I'd want to constrain this too much. 
Um, it's very common for people to observe the constraint that a product can be in a particular order exactly once and try and constrain that relationship. So I'm actually going to go, we'll take a look at the rules again. So uh, here, no order contains the same product more than once. Okay, so we look at that. It doesn't contain the same product more than once. The product's either in or out, okay, more than once. Zero or, it contains it zero or one times. If you let this one rattle around in your head for a while, it's actually pretty common for people to stare at this and think, oh, okay, so I need to have a constraint between product and order. Um, but you don't. So if I, but let's just reason through it. If I were to add the constraint, let's say over here, let's read it off. Every product is contained in exactly one order. Okay, well that's, that's ridiculous. We don't want that. We want a product to be contained in hundreds of orders or maybe zero. So we don't want a constraint going in that direction. Every order contains exactly one pro, okay, well we don't want that either. Every order theoretically could contain nothing, I guess, uh, or it, it could contain a hundred things. So we don't want a, a cardinality constraint on either end of that arrow. My advice is usually, if you think you want a constraint, pencil it in and then read it off. And if when you read it off, it doesn't sound right, then get rid of it. It's usually better to err on the side of no constraint than to err on the side of a constraint. Even if it sounds okay, but has like one problem, it's better to get rid of it. So first, let's think about this. My general rule of thumb is to draw it in and then read it off, but there's also these, these things we can, we can ask abstractly. If I have two entities x and y, so that is, if I'm considering this situation here, I have entity x over there and I have entity y over here, and I've got some relationship between them, I guess, because a cardinality constraint wouldn't exist if I don't have that, then the question is, do I uh, add a constraint to either end? Okay, so the first question is, can I ever have an x without some y existing too? Um, and in this case, products can exist even if they aren't in an order. So, so I, I would argue that in that case, uh, there should be no constraint. So in that case, x doesn't need y to exist. On the other hand, an order might not be able to exist without a customer that places it. So in that case, can x exist without y? Can orders exist without customers? Maybe the answer is no. Can multiple x's be related to the same y? So in this case, the example I would use is, um, can multiple orders contain the same product? The answer is yes, I could have the same product appear in multiple orders. And then, is there some minimum number of x's or maximum that can be related to a given y? So is there some minimum number of orders that have to contain a certain product or maximum number? And if you think about that carefully, you'd say that doesn't even really make sense. Orders are all independent. Whether my, the order I'm placing today is allowed to contain raspberries doesn't generally need to be tied into whether an existing set of orders already contains that product. So those are questions to ask. It's good to reason through these because cardinality constraints, if we're overzealous, are a really easy way of breaking uh, an ER model. And I think in terms of marks deducted for easily preventable reasons, that is not completely screwing up the structure of the diagram, I, I think we, people lose a lot of marks for adding constraints that they, they could have just as easily not added. Um, so. Maybe we could argue in this case, an order can't exist without a customer. It doesn't make sense to pl for an order to be placed if nobody placed it and there was no customer placing the order, no customer involved. So in that case, if an order can't exist without a customer, then it makes sense to add a constraint. Um, and because of the rules we already saw, uh, a particular order is associated with a sales rep and a customer. Not two sales reps, not five customers, one and one. So in that case, we can see that there does need to be a constraint that exists, and it needs to exist in all cases, not just you know in the usual case. Um, but it's also worth considering that the opposite end of those arrows doesn't exist. A particular customer can place 10 different orders. So there's no one to one, it's many to one. Um, many orders can be placed by one customer, um, and every order has to have exactly one customer associated with it. So I would, I would add strict many to one constraints to those two things. And so again, just like in part two, we can, once we've added them to our diagram, let's read them off. An order is sold by exactly one sales rep. An order is placed by exactly one customer. And then in the opposite direction, just to be sure, a customer places orders 
it doesn't, there's no arrow. Um, so there's no constraint there. If we added a constraint, that would say a customer places exactly one order, which doesn't make too much sense in a system like this. Ideally, we want our customers to place lots of orders. And same thing with uh, sales reps. So those two cardinality constraints we can justify. Now, it's worth looking back at that set of rules just to make sure that we're not missing something. Maybe it, did, it could turn out on an assignment or something. It says, yeah, 10 customers can get together and place an order. But if we have a rule like that, then the diagram is now reflecting that faithfully. And that's our goal, is to have a model that models every one of our constraints, everything in our set of rules, but is also faithful to the data. It doesn't add any, anything extra. It doesn't take anything away. Um, and this is pointing out, like I said earlier, that we don't want to touch this. It's tempting. We seem to think it needs it, but we don't want to do that. An order can contain any number of products. A product may appear in multiple orders. There's no reason to begin adding constraints to that relationship. Can orders contain zero items? Okay, well, see, that's a tough one. Um, and how can the model be altered to allow the same product to appear multiple times in one order? So both of these are things to think about. Can orders contain zero items? This is a thought question. Should we allow an order to contain zero items? Because if we, if we are requiring orders to contain at least one item, we could then write in a constraint greater than or equal to one here. An order contains greater than or equal to one products. The reason we have to ask that question is that even if logically customers aren't going to go placing zero item orders, is there ever a case where an order gets into our system with zero items? For example, could a customer open up a new order and then begin adding products? And before they've added a product, could it be empty? I'd say the answer is probably yes. So this, is, uh, this question is trying to remind you that when you get to a situation like this, you still might want to leave well enough alone. It's true, maybe you'd rather orders didn't contain zero items. That's your preference, but is that a universal law? And then this is asking something, suppose that we relax that constraint and for some reason I'm allowed to place an order for a kilogram of raspberries and a kilogram of raspberries and a kilogram of raspberries. I, I might actually do that. Um, and I don't know, a kilogram of something else, a kilogram of apples. I, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. I'm, I'll, just, I'll just take the raspberries. But suppose I want to do something like that. How can we alter this? And in this case, this, cons this relationship gives us some trouble there. Um, either an order is associated with a product or not. So I need to think about how to modify this to allow that. But before we deal with that, so that, those are thought questions for later. Um, I want to talk about more features. And we finally have this nice word, key. Which attributes would comprise good keys? Okay, so there we are back in database land. We've been drawing pictures for too long. We finally see some terminology that we're familiar with. So what I want to think about is, what does it really mean to define a key on an entity? So this is talking about keys for entities, not keys for relationships, just keys for entities. It turns out that we don't care too much about keys for relationships. If it comes down to defining database tables and keys, when we define the tables that go with relationships, we have a conversion that, that describes that, that um, how to define keys for those things. So the question is, if I hand you an entity in a vacuum, so just the entity by itself, that's all you're allowed to look at, is there some attribute or collection of attributes that you can assert will behave the way a key behaves? So what is a key in an abstract sense in a relation? Let's not worry about dependencies or anything else. What does it really mean? A key is a collection of attributes so that no two uh, rows in the relation, no two tuples in the relation, will ever have the same value in uh, the, all of those attributes and the key attributes. What it's really saying is what uniquely defines the row. Or in this case, it turns out that, that our entities, each instance of one of our entities, turns out to be a row in a table. So when I ask for the key of an entity, I'm saying give me a one or more attributes that together uniquely defines every instance of this entity. There will never be two entities that aren't the same thing that have the same value in all of these attributes. So already we might notice that that means if, as a fallback, we can always choose the key to be everything. Uh, if you do that and it's not justified, then you've got a problem. Um, but we could do that. We want to otherwise select a key that uniquely identifies each entity. And we're going to notice that we sometimes have trouble doing that. Um, so uh, when we select keys, um, we will make some reasonable assumptions. So, for example, it might be reasonable to assume that a particular product, if I have a supplier, so the source of the product, they will probably only have one product with a given name. And I think in this diagram, which is simplified, it's reasonable to make that assumption. 
So from from a, it might be that a, you might get raspberries from multiple suppliers, or there are multiple suppliers that make a product called bread or something. But in particular, a, a, a particular brand, a particular supplier will only make one product with a given name. So what I'll do is I'll say, well, that means that the name and the source of the product together comprise a key. And you'll notice that I am underlining, just like I would in relational notation, I am underlining the names of the key attributes. This is not one of the attributes in the key. It's, it's just a property. It's not a, a defining characteristic. So product, its name and its source. Uh, a customer, OK, so I could have two customers with the same name. I guess I could also have two customers with the same phone number. Now, it's a bit risky, and we'll see that actually we'd rather err on the safe side here, but for the sake of this example, let's assume, therefore, that a name and phone number together will uniquely identify a customer. You'll never have two customers with the same name and same phone number. Now, actually, if you were designing a real database, you would not make that assumption because that's, a, that's risky. Um, it's not likely to ever be a problem, but you don't want to take a risk like that. But here we'll make that assumption. It actually turns out the set of rules earlier implies that we're allowed to do that. Same is true for sales rep. If I look only at the attributes of sales rep and I decide two, two reps will not have both the same name and phone number, then I could choose those as the key. The problem is we still have one entity left and it, it's going to cause us a bit of trouble. So if I look at the entity in a vacuum, I'm only allowed to define it based on its own characteristics. How do I define a key? Well, I can't do this. I mean, maybe this is my only choice, but we can see that if I were to do this, then the way that I defined order creates some trouble for me. So I'm always allowed if I have an entity, and like once the entities are, are constituted for a system, I can always choose all of the attributes together as a key. So this is valid. I can say date is a key. The question that the slide is asking is, if we do that, why? what kinds of trouble are we causing ourselves? And the issue here is that if date is a key, I'm saying there can't be two orders with the same date, which if my business is going to boom, I don't want that constraint. I want there to be as many. I want to be able to place thousands of orders with the same date. What that's telling us isn't that there's something broken about the way we choose keys. It's telling us that order isn't well defined. We need more information to define what an order truly is than just its date. Certainly, if you look at it, secretly what's happening is an order is a function of a date, but also a customer and a sales rep and a bunch of products. And we'll see in a minute that there's a, a very powerful way of being able to um, define a key for order based on those things. But we have another option, and it's not my favorite. So we'd really rather avoid doing this. This would be a case where you could justify doing it. Um, on an assignment or an exam, you are expected to justify. And if you don't just, if you use this feature without giving a, a robust justification, so if all of the other options um, don't work, then it's valid. But if there are, are other options that do work, you really have to explain yourself well, and you'll lose marks if you don't. There is an option for saying, OK, so an order can't just be identified by a date. But I need a way. An order should be its own entity, independent, living in the world by itself. I need a way of identifying it. Because if I don't have a way of identifying it, all of my other logic falls apart. I can't have date be its key. I need a key for the order entity. Um, so just the slides are pointing this out. It's not the keys aren't the problem. It's that I've missed something. I need to add more detail to my diagram. What I could do is I could say, hey, what I'll, I'll just number my orders. I want to have more than one order on a given date, which means I need some attribute of the order entity that, that distinguishes the different orders on a particular date. So what I'll do is I'll number them all. In fact, I won't even bother numbering them by day. I won't have you know, the first order on May 26th, the first order on May 27th, the second order on May 27th. I'll just start my ordering at my, my numbering at 1. Order number 1, order number 2, order number 5,000. And each order has a date that I can retrieve if I want it. So I will make up a synthetic um, attribute called ID, the order ID. And I will, because I've just made this up, I will guarantee that ID is always unique, that no two orders have the same ID. Because it's a made up attribute, I'm allowed to impose that condition. So because I've done that and IDs are now unique, it can be a key. So I've now created a synthetic key. Uh, and maybe you can appreciate that this is something I'm allowed to do as the database designer, but I'm taking on a certain amount of responsibility here because I've now added data to my system that wasn't in the original list of rules. And so I better have a damn good reason for doing it or I could get myself into trouble. And on the usual logic that the more data we have, the harder it is to manage. So what we've created here is what's called a surrogate key. And we create this if we have something, an entity, that doesn't seem to have enough information contained inside its existing attributes to comprise a key for, it, for the use of the entity as we've envisioned it. 
where there is no other feature of our diagram that would provide that information. So we'll see in a minute something called a weak entity that gives us a way around this problem in some cases. But in many cases, we have no other option. We have to introduce new data, a synthetic data, and we call that a surrogate key. So to be clear, we can do this, but be prepared to justify it if you do. We want to do anything possible to allow our keys to be defined using existing pieces of data. A lot of people's reaction once they learn about surrogate keys is to say, oh, great, we'll just add an ID to everything. There's an ID, there's an ID, there's an ID. Now I never have to worry about creating keys again. Everything just gets a numerical index. The reason why that's a really annoying thing to do, why that doesn't help our database, is that the key for a particular entity um, carries a lot of information about the characterization of that entity to the rest of the database. If everything is now identified by some faceless number, then it actually becomes a great deal more difficult to do, for example, searches of my data later. If customers are classified by their name and phone number, then I can set my table up to be easily searchable by name and phone number because those are unique. Um, that means if I want to look up a customer by name, it should be pretty easy. If I just make up this synthetic column ID, then I, I ask, give me all the customers named Bill Bird. Okay, well, the table is, sorry, the table's organized by IDs. What's Bill Bird's ID? Well, I don't have it. Okay, let's just do, let's linear search the table. Um, there are ways of making the table searchable by other things besides its key, but the goal of a key is to provide not only um, a unique identifier, but a characterization. We want the key to mean something, and so we really want to use surrogate keys sparingly. Now, many of you who have worked with databases in the wild have observed probably that there are lots of surrogate keys out there. The reason isn't because surrogate keys are cheap and we should always use them. The reason is because often it really isn't possible to classify data using its own attributes. It turns out that here, customer would probably need to be given an ID. Not because it's cool to use surrogate keys, because we can't really assume that there are no two customers with, this, with the same name at the same phone number. That's it. It's not because it's a surrogate key is actually a good idea. It's because there really isn't any better idea here. And you might notice, actually, if you go looking at the types of data that you've seen, take a look at your own personal information. You might notice that all of the times you get entered into a data system, a surrogate key is probably being used to identify you because no combination of your attributes, which might be a combination of, let's say, name, date of birth, phone number, email address, whatever, no combination of those things could be truly assumed to be unique. There could be two people with your name born on the same date. Um, and so that, that creates a bit of a problem. It, I guess theoretically, you and the other person born on the same date as yourself could become friends and decide to move in together and share a phone, and then you'd end up with the same phone number. So th the difficulty is because we can never universally assume that those attributes are unique, we have to make up surrogate keys. And that's especially true for information about people. So you'll notice at UVic, you have a student ID, V00123456 or something else. Um, if you work with, if you deal with um, your government-related accounts, you probably identify yourself by your social insurance number, uh, which again is unique. It is it, because there could be lots of people with the same name, and so the government has assigned everybody a unique number for that purpose. If you work with your bank, you'll typically work with an account number, um, which sidesteps that problem to some extent. But you might notice when you want to log into online banking, in some cases they do ask for your client number, your client card number, or something similar, because they don't want to just go by name for a lot of, well, and that's also for a security reason. So surrogate keys are a good idea when they are necessary. They are, in my opinion, not a good idea when they are not necessary. From the design point of view, we shouldn't be introducing surrogate keys early for the sake of optimizing things we don't know we need to optimize yet. We should only be introducing them in cases where we don't have enough information to comprise a key otherwise. And I'm saying this all now so that I can point people who come and argue with me about mark, being marked down for surrogate key use to look at this video, to look at this, what probably is now amounted to a 20-minute rant about surrogate keys. I say, go to the slide number 30 in ER Modeling 3, and you can hear what I think about surrogate keys. They're a good idea, but they need to be used sparingly, and you will get marked down if you can't justify their use. Um, so this slide is pointing out that, yeah, we'll, you're going to see a lot of cases where we throw surrogate keys at everything, and we should be careful about that. Um, it's important, though, that I think here, these two things, definitely we would probably need a surrogate key. Name and phone number isn't good enough. We should probably throw surrogate keys at those. This is a tough one. So before I was saying the same supplier doesn't make two products with the same name. Well, I think that's reasonable, but on the other hand, I'm not in charge of that. 
if in, I'm the, the merchant selling the products, I don't name the products at the supplier level. So if I don't trust my suppliers to always obey that rule, and it's not a law, so I can't guarantee they will, then even here I would need a surrogate key. So despite the fact that I don't like overuse of surrogate keys, this is actually a valid use of surrogate keys on every single entity. Um, you'll notice on the assignment and ultimately on exam questions, it does say if you use surrogate keys, you better justify their use. And we, we will accept pretty generously justifications for surrogate keys, but you shouldn't just be adding them to every entity. You should make an effort to identify if the entity already contains one. So one example where you would get marked down severely for adding one is here. Suppose you, you acknowledge that, yeah, name and phone does, don't work. Suppose for some reason you were storing your customer's social insurance numbers. You were keeping track of orders. I don't know why you'd have this information, but you had the customer's social insurance number. Okay, so in that case, you wouldn't do this, you wouldn't do this, you'd make this the key. And if you went and added a customer ID on top of that, you'd get marked down because why would you need such a thing? You already have what is known to be a unique identifier because this is actually designed to be a surrogate key in, in, in uh, some other context. So when you already have information that uniquely identifies the customer, adding more doesn't help. Uh, it confuses things and it actually makes our data harder to juggle later. Um, and so this is pointing out, uh, I actually already I got ahead of myself, that because we don't want to trust, uh, for example, that our suppliers don't have two products with the same name, it's reasonable to assume they don't, but we don't want to trust them, this might be a better idea just to play it safe. And that would be your justification. You would write, yeah, look, I, I get that name and source should comprise a good key, but my suppliers might not feel the same way, and they're the ones who decide the product's name. Um, and so this points out, it doesn't, hurt, it doesn't necessarily destroy the data model. That is to say, your data model is still faithful, but it is a bad idea to introduce superfluous sur surrogate keys. You need to be able to justify using them because we don't need to add them if we don't need to add them. Um, they won't hurt the faithfulness of the data model, but they will clutter things up later. And when you get used to writing queries, so that'll be in a few weeks, you will begin to notice where extra keys that maybe didn't need to exist uh, would be harmful. There are a few of the tables, uh, databases that we work with where the data has been pulled in from an outside source where there are these extra keys that, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to add them, but I've kept them in there because the database is from somewhere else. And you'll notice why they tend to be quite annoying to work with. Okay, so let's go back to our earlier example here. We're looking at this one. We should be familiar with this from part one. Let's create keys for this. And let's decide when we need a surrogate key and when we don't. So let's just, you know, spitballing here, let's just try using name for student and instructor, uh, also name for instructor too. We already saw just a minute ago, that's probably a really bad idea. Uh, I, you know, I wish I'd done this, but I, I could probably go to Connex and figure out whether we have more than one student with the same name in this course right now. But I, I don't want to take that risk. Certainly, whether it's this course or some other course, we shouldn't assume that every student has a completely unique name. So name doesn't work. The combination of name, address, and phone, or, or name and address, even that's not great. So an instructor, okay, it's probably the case that there are two instructors on campus with the same name. I doubt that they're in the same department. <clears throat> I don't want to make that assumption universally, though. So that's not a good idea. This isn't a good idea because two students with the same name could live at the same address. It would be peculiar. It would be hard to sort the mail, but that's possible. And so if I make this assumption in my data model, I'm making it for all time. We're stuck with this decision forever. So we don't want to make this decision either. So here I would say, yep, I can't, no combination of these things will ever actually uniquely identify a student. And it's worth considering, <clears throat> even though it wouldn't help us, this should never be part of a key for a different reason, which is that it isn't really a defining characteristic of the student. It's a property, that is the student has chosen a major, I guess, but they could change that and it doesn't really fundamentally change their identity to change the major. They could change their phone and email address or name and, and home address as well, but that would be a, a, a more a rare occurrence that would tend to coincide with the student consciously changing something about their identifying information. So we shouldn't use major. We also shouldn't use department for instructor because the instructor could change department. So instead, we will introduce, we will consciously and carefully introduce a surrogate key called ID for both student and instructor. With no other options, it appears as if we have no choice. On the other hand, um, whoops, on the other hand, we do not need an ID for course and you would lose marks um, unless you could give a very good justification and I'd love to hear it for why you'd be unable to use the attributes already sitting on top of course 
to comprise a key. So name of the course, yeah, course names, they do change occasionally for a variety of different reasons. The typical one is that the course, its, it's um, role is shifted slightly and we add content or remove content or we update it for more modern terminology or something. A course can be moved between departments. I've seen that happen every now and then, fair enough. Um, but the cryptic course code, so think CSC 370, that is unique. There is only one course called CSC 370 at this university. It's true we could change the course number tomorrow, but that would be no different than somebody changing their name or, or whatever. Or frankly, somebody's student ID or instructor ID changing. It's still unique. Whether it can change isn't the issue. It's whether there can ever be duplicates, ever two instructors with the same ID, ever two courses with the same course code. And it turns out that, yeah, the course code has been defined at the university level to be a unique identifier. Um, and it actually is a surrogate key uh, in, a, in a primitive sense. The university's course code system dates back to before the idea of a surrogate key was invented, but that was the, 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 role, the goal of creating it. Um, it's worth considering that the course name, not only is the course name going to change or whatever, but also it isn't a unique attribute because there likely are, for example, a few courses on campus called introductory statistics because uh, a lot of disciplines teach their own statistics courses. Um, so we want to be careful about that. But the course code is defined to be unique, and so we should use that as our key. Creating a surrogate key there creates duplication, because we now have two surrogate keys in our system, because the course code really is already a surrogate key. It's one that we've inherited from somewhere else. So what about this? <clears throat> now, it says, from the US election data example. I'm quite aware that you haven't seen any US election data example. And that's because I think that's one of these things I, I, I've held out to um, maybe do as one of the live examples. So bear with me here. In the U.S., they've got states. And the states often contain counties, which are divisions of a particular state. I think the election data example I'm talking about is using data from 20, uh, probably the 2016 election, maybe the 2018 election. So I've got this situation here where a county is part of a state. And then I think, well, I have to create keys on my ER diagram. Ultimately, to bring the ER diagram all the way to fruition, to produce database tables, I'm going to need keys. What are the keys going to be? Am I going to need a surrogate key? And I want to avoid creating a surrogate key. So can name comprise a key for county? I think in the US states, name is a valid key for a state. We have to think about our data a bit, but I think that's valid. The same way that name would be a valid key for province in Canada. Because we can reasonably assume that the uh, Canadian Federation will not admit another province called British Columbia. And, I mean, it might, there might be more provinces that form at some point, um, but they're not going to be another one called British Columbia. Or if there is, we'll rename the existing one that's called British Columbia. So that requires thinking about our data. There could be two people with the same name, but it's unlikely we're ever going to see... Actually, no, I'd say it's reasonable to assume we're never going to see two states in the U.S. with the same name. So name, good key for the state entity. What about county name? So every state contains a bunch of counties. Is it reasonable to assume that if I look at just the name of a county by itself, that that will never occur twice? And we need to think a bit about what counties can be named, but it turns out that the answer is that's not a reasonable assumption. Because counties are often, uh, because they're regional, small regional jurisdictions, they're often named something, in many cases, something vague and patriotic. Here we have Washington County. And it turns out that in a lot of parts of the U.S., they are quite fond of George Washington. And that means we've got a Washington County in Alabama. We have one in Colorado. We have one in Georgia and Iowa and Idaho and Illinois and Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky and Maryland. Um, and I missed, sorry, I missed Arkansas and Colorado and Florida. We've got lots of Washington counties, and they, they voted apparently, but we'll talk about the election data example some other time. The issue is we can't assume that county names are unique. So what do we do? <clears throat> do we add a surrogate key on county? So, I don't know. The issue here is that if I just say, yeah, okay, we'll number all the counties, that's sort of a mess because really the county's identity is defined by stuff we already have. The issue is it's not defined by stuff that's contained inside county. There is only one Washington County inside of Kentucky. There's only just, just the one. And it's reasonable, just like how there's only one British Columbia inside of Canada, because from an administrative point of view, they would never want to have two counties have the same name. So it's reasonable to assume a given state only contains one instance of a given county name. That means that if I was allowed to have something like this, I could make name and state name a key for county because there's only one county with a particular name in a particular state. Why would I not do this? 
Well, because of that old avoiding duplication problem. State name is not actually part of county. It's part of state. I'm just borrowing it for the sake of making a key for county. So I shouldn't be adding extra attributes that duplicate other parts of the diagram. So what do I do? Well, really the issue here is that county is sort of subordinate to state. I mean, literally, county is contained inside of a state. It doesn't actually have to have that direct relationship to need this feature, though. The key for county depends on things that are contingent on this relationship, this part of relationship, which means a county is part of exactly one state. That relationship helps to define what the county is. So the Washington County inside of Iowa is different from the Washington County inside of Kentucky because the Washington County in Iowa is part of Iowa and the Washington County in Kentucky is part of Kentucky. So this relationship supports the identity of county. In a sense, that means that it's not really the usual equal relationship. It's not like customer and order. A customer can add products to an order or whatever, the order exists more or less independently. It has a customer associated, but it can exist independently. County, to have a key, to be well-defined, needs something, to borrow something from the state entity. So we say that this is a supporting entity for county, and this is a supporting relationship for county. It needs these to exist uniquely. And in particular, the symptom we're looking for here is, to define a key for county, I have to borrow elements from something that county depends on. I need the key from state to be sort of folded in as part of the key for county. I need to borrow it. So county isn't really a full entity here because it needs to borrow attributes from a different entity. And so we call it a weak entity. So county is a weak entity, and we'll call this a supporting relationship or whatever. Um, it's, so county is supported by the state entity via the part of supporting relationship. When we do that, by creating a weak entity that depends on something else, and the reason why this has to be, uh, we have to use a special double diamond for this, so the notation of the double box here is to say that county is weak. The reason we use a double diamond for the supporting relationship is to make it very clear that the thing that county is borrowing from is state. So county borrows as part of its key whatever is in the key for state, in this case the state's name. The reason why we need a double diamond is um, we could have relationships that are not supporting relationships. So here's a person, and the person is a resident of a county. This is just a normal single diamond relationship, the, the, the same kind of relationship we've seen all along. County can participate in regular relationships like any other entity. This relationship is special because this is the relationship that helps get county its key. So we have to use a special notation when we uh, draw the supporting relationship for a weak entity. Um, and we also might observe that we actually have to have a many-to-one constraint on that supporting relationship. So a county is part of exactly one state, and you have to have that if you're going to borrow the key for the supporting entity as part of the key for county. Because if you need to borrow the key, there can't be like three states attached to each county. A county can't be part of three states. It has to be part of exactly one state. So there's exactly one name that you have to borrow um, from the supporting entity. Uh, it's worth also noting that that's, there's an implication that's only one way there. If I have a double diamond, that implies that I need a rounded arrow. And just to be clear, you need to draw the rounded arrow anyway, um, but if I see the double diamond, there needs to be a rounded arrow on one end of it, the end opposite the weak entity. That doesn't mean that every time I see a rounded arrow, I have a double diamond. It's perfectly valid, as you've seen in previous parts, for this rounded arrow to exist outside of the context of weak entities. Um, okay, and I've fast-forwarded too much. So the reason why this is significant is that this does give us the ability to have an entity whose existence is contingent on another entity in a way that we haven't seen already. If we think of all the other ways we have to define an entity as being subordinate, none of them really give us this property. We have the is relationship, but a county, it, it isn't true that a county is a state. A county is related to a state in a manner that we need characteristics of the state to know which county we're talking about. So county is not a full entity on its own without borrowing something from the parent entity's state. So the way that I would say, like usually the telltale sign you need a weak entity is if the entity you're looking at, which maybe isn't weak yet, as its key doesn't have enough information on hand to form a key, and as its key it needs to borrow something from something else. 
You don't want to add a, a surrogate key if you can do that, if you can borrow the name attribute of the state entity. And we'll see later that you might notice there's a conflict here, county name and state name, they're, just, they're both called name. It turns out that when we convert this to tables, we can disambiguate that. We can have the, the relationship be county name, state name. That's just an implementation decision. All right, so let's take a look at uh, this example here. So I, I want to talk about the keys as they apply to our subclass relationships from part two. So here we've got um, a book and books have a, an author and the author is a person so we have a written by relationship as opposed to just a, a regular attribute. But books also have a title, whoever published them, the year they were published, number of pages, and this special identification number, this ISBN. Now it's true that there are various types of books. There are you know, cookbooks, dictionaries, uh, whatever, but we'll just talk about um, dictionaries here. So a dictionary is a book and it has other attributes. So I guess, I don't know, it's a dictionary for a particular language. And you can, as I said, you can sort of in, envision that there are various other types of, I don't know, like Atlas or something. There are various other types of books um, that we could use here. I think it'll be obvious if I just do one example how we treat all of the other ones. The question is, how do we define keys for this? Now, maybe it's clear we might need a surrogate key for author. Let's, for the sake of simplicity, not worry as much about author. Let's think about book. So first question, do we need a surrogate key for book? You could look at this and say, well, there's probably more than one, whoop, there's probably more than one book with the same title, Bill, so I guess I'll just add a surrogate key. Yeah, okay, well, good luck explaining that. Um, we need more of a justification than, oh, I can't use title for this. So you probably can't use title for that. That's a good instinct. We may have two books with the same title. On the other hand, um, this ISBN number is a unique identifier for every book. It, in fact, is a surrogate key from somewhere else. So we can use that as our key. Um, just a note for people staring at this and saying, wow, on an exam, do I have to know what an ISBN number is? No, obviously, on an exam or an assignment, we would clarify what that meant. Um, but I, I was able to talk through that in this example. Um, for the sake of simplicity, let's assume authors' names are unique. I mean, yeah, I, I'm gonna, I'll concede that that could be a good use of a surrogate key. Um, the key thing I want to describe here, though, is <clears throat> what do we do with this versus book? So dictionary is an entity on the diagram. It's a, it's a green box. Why does it not have any of its attributes underlined? Well, the is relationship tells us that dictionary inherits every property of book. And in particular, anything that's a dictionary is a book, which means even if I didn't have this, an English dictionary would, would have to be able to function perfectly in the world only defined by this stuff. And if you think about it, that means that whatever I use to uniquely identify a book has to be able to uniquely identify a dictionary because a dictionary is a book. And therefore, I don't need to define any specific key for dictionary. And in fact, I'm not allowed to. Because if I were, uh, that would imply that there is something more unique about the attributes of dictionary than would be already provided by book, which basically contradicts that the key for book is valid. So when you have the is relationship defined, you always make sure to define the keys on whatever the parent is and you don't define any key attributes on the child. And just to be um, completely clear, I guess I've got to, I'm gonna try and on the fly come up with some subclass of dictionary. Okay, what is a, a specific type of dictionary? How about the, a pocket dictionary, which nobody has actually. Had. Okay, if you notice an edit there, that would be the place where my, uh, my PDF readers stop behaving and then weird random stuff happen for about two minutes. So hopefully I remember to edit that out. Um, what I want to do, now that we're back in reality, hopefully, what I want to do is I want to define some entity that is a subclass of dictionary just for the sake of proving a point. Um, let's see if I can remember what the point was. So suppose that I have this thing, I don't know, a pocket dictionary, and I think one of the observations I made just before things went to hell with my PDF reader was nobody might know what this is anymore because people used to have these pocket dictionaries because they didn't have a smartphone. But um, suppose I have this and then there's my is relationship and the dictionary, so the pocket dictionary is a dictionary. Just to be clear, um, the, uh, what, is it, what is an attribute of a pocket dictionary? It's thickness or something. How pocket sized is it? Thickness. So just to be clear, when I say do not define key attributes for things that are child, uh, the child of a subclass relationship, that goes all the way down. So here, pocket dictionary does not need its own key attributes because it is something else. It's a subclass, so I don't define a key. Okay, dictionary is also a subclass, so I don't define a key for it either. 
The only thing I define a key for is the parent entity. And just to sketch that out more generally, if I have a full hierarchy of different subclasses here, <clears throat> The only thing I define a key for is the thing at the top. So then there's my key attribute, so x, y, z. Um, and so that's, that's significant. And I mentioned a minute ago um, in your time that uh, if you attempt to define keys, if I put an underline here, I'm actually creating a contradiction. I'm implying that there's something about the key for book that isn't unique enough which obviously isn't a good idea, and it, it sort of corrupts the faithfulness of the diagram to the data. Okay, so let's look at this. <clears throat> and I, I, We've spent a lot of time talking about these pairwise relationships, and we've got a bunch of them here. And you might also see that I've, I've, for some reason, integrated various bits of data. This is another flippant example, like the one with the brain that has thoughts. But I've, And actually, this is also not my example. I, should, I have to give credit um, to, I think, the book and also my colleague Alex Thomo. I, I'm not sure who came up with this. This is an example unique among the rest in my slides, which, which I sort of cobbled together. This example comes to us via, for all I know, like decades of CSC 370 history. So that means any weird issues that I'm not going to take the blame for either. So no credit, no blame. Um, what I want to talk about is a case where a, th a relationship with three uh, participants, so a, a relationship with three legs, might be a good idea because the pairwise ones don't give us enough information. So here I've got three, uh, and this is the famous bars, beers, and drinkers example. So I've got three entities and three relationships, which are all valid. I mean, th these are valid relationships, but maybe they don't give me enough information. So a drinker drinks beer, a bar sells beer, a drinker visits the bar. And we might notice that there's something that we might need that isn't captured in this. Um, we might also define other relationships. So just the, the purpose of this example is to round out all the different possibilities of things that we don't see in our more um, specific examples. So first, we are allowed to define relationships between the same two entities multiple ways. So a drinker drinks beer. That's a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, but a drinker has exactly one favorite beer. And maybe I would argue that the only issue with that is maybe that's better to use a solid arrow because maybe a drinker does not have a favorite beer. But they certainly aren't allowed by this model to have three favorite beers. So we are allowed to define extra a second relationship between the same two entities. That's completely valid. Um, and we'll see later why that makes sense. It turns out we just use more tables in our database. So let's create keys. Um, so just to, in, in case, any of you need some induction into the world of beer, um, the uh, name of a particular beer might not be unique. So I can't choose, this would not be a good key. And the, the table here, uh, this is, these are all, I had to go find this data myself. These are all local beers. I had to go find this data. And this, is, this was a work-related activity I was doing when I found this data. Um, it turns out that the name of a beer, if it's, if it's uh, one of the standard ones, you know, they might just call it Pilsner or something. And so two different breweries could make a beer with the same name. And the reason we like this example is because it actually demonstrates that issue earlier about the product and supplier um, needing to be used together as the key. So because of that, I have to use both name and brewery. I can reasonably assume that a commercial brewery wouldn't make two distinct products with exactly the same name. Now, as with earlier, depending on the scale of your data model, you might not want to make that assumption. You might want to be a bit paranoid about that. I think it's reasonable here. So name and brewery together does define a unique identifier for um, beer. And the same is true. So for some reason, we're keeping track of our drinkers' social insurance numbers. Because that's already a surrogate key from some other system, we better use that. Don't try and make up a drinker ID or something. Um, a bar has an address, and I'm, I'm, in my mind, address means the street address plus the unit number. Uh, so that you can't have two bars at the same physical address, by my reckoning. Um, if that were the case, then maybe name plus address or maybe a surrogate key would be justified. But we now have keys. Um, do these relationships model the, re the interactions between these three entities? They certainly model a lot of interactions. So a drinker drinks beer, okay, and a drinker visits a bar, fair enough, and the bar sells beer. So we've tied everything together. But have we tied it together with enough detail? And that's a, that's a difficult question because we don't know what the original specification for this system was. The point of the example is to sort of show off the different ways we can model relationships. We have to consider that all this tells us, drinker drinks beer, is the list of, for a given drinker, what beers they drink, if any. Um, 
And this shows off for a given drinker what bars they visit, or for a given bar what drinkers visit the bar. And this shows off the list of beers sold by a bar. Great. But we're not considering the fact that maybe somebody's choice of what to drink depends on what bar they're visiting, and they might not drink certain things if... Oh yeah, right, okay. This is the kind of... I'm pretty sure that this is a typical like slide joke problem. I have a feeling, I, I've done this long enough now, I think I could make this joke work in an actual lecture in person, but I'm just going to leave it. I'll leave it in the slides. No shame, but we'll just go past it. So the problem is, what if a particular drinker would only drink a certain beer if they go to a particular place? Which would be uh, maybe because that place doesn't have a good selection. I don't want to be too specific what I think about which beer and which place, but um, it could be somebody only drinks a particular beer if they end up at this particular bar that doesn't have any good beer. Um, we might want to model that. We don't want to assume that, oh, the drinker drinks that beer. They must like it. Well, maybe they hate it. Maybe they just like going to this bar that doesn't have any good beer. Um, so we need to find a way of modeling that, and this doesn't do it, because all it tells us is who drinks what and where do they go, not who drinks what at which place. And so here, we might want to try modeling it this way. We might want to be able to model the drinks relationship with three legs, which is drinker, beer, and bar. So then we know uh, for a particular drinker and beer, which bar do they drink it? And if we want to then uh, gather some data on what their favorites are or something, or, or not just their, their single favorite, but what beers they seem to generally like, we can then look at, of the sets of instances of this three-way relationship, are there any beers that the same drinker drinks at all different at all the different bars they go to? That might imply that they really like it, as opposed to uh, a beer they only drink at one bar because it's the only beer that bar has. Um, so let's take a look at uh, this diagram here, which has been modified slightly. Notice how uh, here I've added the address of the brewery. Uh, and the question is, why is it not a good idea? So we're just wrapping up a bunch of ER diagram notation issues here. Why is it not a good idea to uh, include the brewery address as just an attribute of beer? And this, this we've sort of touched this one a few times, which th there are some cases where the data we have, so things, data on the edge of our perception, like the brewery address, if the point of our data model is to take care of this set of relationships, maybe the brewery address is a very, very tertiary aspect. We don't care too much about it. We've seen already that in cases where we're getting far away from the purpose of our data, we just sort of throw things in as flat attributes. Um, this is asking, is it really a good idea to do that here? And it actually is a matter of, it, it depends on quite a few factors beyond what the diagram is saying. But suppose that we just ask the question flat out, so we don't worry about the, the, the needs of this system, because we haven't seen the original requirements. Why is it a bad idea to have something be an attribute versus, I don't know, something else? And I would argue in here, the problem is I could have my, my I could have three breweries in town. Um, Victoria's got way more than that. I could have like 12 or 15 breweries in town, and I could have a thousand beers in my database. And each one is now storing with each entity this brewery address, which we know isn't really a function of the beer. It's a function of the brewery that makes the beer. And that's a source of redundancy. And so in, in that context, maybe having it attached to beer, it, we're jumping over a couple of links there. The brewery certainly can be attached to beer because we have to know which brewery it is, and maybe we don't care too much about the identity of the brewery if all we care about is this stuff. But if we care enough to keep track of where the brewery is in town, then clearly breweries mean something to us in our data model. And so in that context, if we, if we care about more uh, about the brewery than just its name, we probably want to have our own entity for brewery in, in this context. Um, and it's also that uh, we might notice that because the brewery is actually part of the beer entity, we have a, a sort of a secondary problem, which is you might see here, the brewery is part of the beer entity and it forms part of its key, which means if I decide to split off brewery and brewery address to be their own entity, I might be in some trouble because then beer doesn't have a key. So if I do it, the end result of that move is that I have to have um, the beer become a weak entity. It has to be supported by the brewery entity because the name of the beer, as we saw, isn't enough to identify the beer uniquely. It has to be both the name of the beer and the name, and it turns out the address of its brewery. Um, because beer is a weak entity, its key will now be the name of the beer and the entire key of the supporting entity. We get no choice in the matter. If I've decided that my brewery, uh, its name and address together form its key, then those will now be part of the key for every beer they make. 
If I want the beer to only contain the brewery name as a key, then I have to come up with some reason to not make the address part of the brewery's key. So when I import a key using a weak entity, I get the entire key of the supporting entity, not just um, whichever attributes I think that I need. So uh, what we've seen now, I think we've talked our way through all of the notation we need for ER diagrams. Uh, we've talked about how to create keys on ER diagrams, and so now finally we are ready to, on the one hand, you can join me on uh, next Monday, June 1st, for a sort of tutorial style discussion of some exercises, and on the other hand you can move on to part four, which talks about the translation of ER diagrams into a database schema.